Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Tiffany Meyer in for Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Less than 24 hours left before life support runs out on the missing Titanic submarine. Search and rescue teams say they're focused on the area where noises were detected. An explosion shakes the city of Paris. Local authorities send hundreds of firefighters to battle the flames. The FBI's investigation into former President Trump's 2016 campaign is back in the spotlight. Find out what Republicans point to as evidence of political bias and how Democrats are pushing back. Over in Georgia, the investigation ends for the two poll workers who infamously pulled ballots from suitcases. The state's Republican Secretary of State says the fraud claims were false. A dictator, that's what President Biden is calling Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping. How that plays into U.S.-China relations amid the latest round of high-level talks. And are mental health issues to blame for students' low test scores? New data shows a decline even into last year. We'll explore what's behind the trend and deeper reasons why students seem to lack purpose. The search and rescue efforts continue for the missing Titanic tour submarine. The U.S. Coast Guard gave a press briefing today and reported no major breakthroughs. The U.S. Coast Guard on Wednesday provided the latest updates on the search and rescue mission for the Titanic tourist submersible that went missing on Sunday. The number of surface vessels in the operation will rise from 5 to 10 in the next 24 to 48 hours, with two remotely operated vehicles underwater now and more on the way. The surface search is now approximately two times the size of Connecticut, and the subsurface search is up to two and a half miles deep exponentially expanding the size of the search area. Sonar devices detected banging noises from underwater on Tuesday, but the Coast Guard isn't sure what the noises are. According to a government memo, the banging came every 30 minutes at first, and then again four hours later. The good news is, what I can tell you is we're searching in the area where the noises were detected, and we'll continue to do so, and we, we hope um, that when we're able to get additional ROVs, which will be there in the morning, the intent will be to continue to search um, in those areas where the noise were detected, and if they're continuing to be detected, and then put additional ROVs down in the last known position where the search was originally taking place. The Coast Guard assured reporters that it's still in the middle of search and rescue, and it's important to remain hopeful. Thursday morning will be a key deadline for finding the submarine, because the vessel's life support is expected to run out by then. The submersible, known as the Titan, was carrying five people, including the CEO of the operating company, Ocean Gate Expeditions. The mothership lost contact with the sub about an hour and 45 minutes into its dive on Sunday. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. In France, an explosion ripped through the streets of Paris today, leaving at least 29 injured with four in critical condition. NTD Sam Wong brings us the latest details. Large plums of smoke billow over the Latin Quarter of central Paris on Wednesday as firefighters shot jets of water at the blaze. Footage shows the facade of a building in the 5th district has collapsed and the neighborhood was left in a state of shock. There was a huge noise and the house shook like this. We thought, what's going on? We thought it could be a storm, but no. We learned later that it was over there. It's awful. The blast was first heard at 4.55 p.m. local time, just as people were heading home from work. The police chief said that the explosion occurred at a fashion and design school, which has now burned down. Residents living in the surrounding streets weren't permitted to return home after the explosion. The area is usually packed with tourists and foreign students in the early summer. Though the flames were eventually extinguished, local authorities are still working to find traces of human life buried under the rubble. The city had mobilized many resources to battle the blaze. Just as I am obviously extremely cautious about the causes of the explosion that sparked this fire, we have deployed 270 firefighters from the Paris Fire Department and 70 vehicles on the ground. As of now, the cause of the explosion remains unknown. But the local deputy mayor suggested that there was a gas leak, and some witnesses on the scene said that there was a strong smell of gas in the air shortly before the blast. Investigators are looking into whether the explosion was the result of individual negligence or some other cause, but no charges are currently under consideration. Paris is no stranger to gas explosions, especially with its dense population and aging infrastructure. Sam Wang, NTD News. 
Special Counsel John Durham testified on Capitol Hill. His report details what went wrong in the FBI's seven-year-old investigation into former President Trump's 2016 campaign. NDD's Melina Weiskup followed this hearing closely today and heard from both sides of the aisle. Well, one concern that Chairman Jim Jordan repeatedly brought up through today's hearing was the question of why the FBI did not investigate Charles Dolan, who was one of the key sources for the Steele dossier. I wanted to find out what Democrats have to say in response to this concern of Jordan's. Here's what they told us. And on Dolan, why do you think the FBI chose not to interview him about the Steele dossier? I think that there's a lot of evidence here in terms of what was already done. Oh, almost three dozen crimes, people that pled guilty to things, corporations. Everyone they prosecuted was convicted. Durham, prosecu after six and a half million dollars, prosecuted two people and took the jury two hours and six hours respectively to, to acquit them. He has no credibility whatsoever. And to that point of those cases pursued by Durham ultimately being acquitted, this is one of the ways that Democrats repeatedly try to discredit Durham's report. That report that was released back in May ultimately says that the FBI skipped key procedures and they had insufficient evidence to launch that full investigation into former President Trump's 2016 campaign, although the Durham did say that a preliminary investigation was needed. Our report should not be read to suggest in any way that Russian election interference was not a significant threat. It was. The FBI opened up Crossfire Hurricane without speaking to the people who provided the initial information. Is that true? That's correct. We found troubling violations of law and policy in the conduct of highly consequential investigations. So if there was legitimate violations of law and policy, why were those cases brought forth by Durham ultimately acquitted? We asked some Republicans why they thought that those key players were not held liable or accountable. Here's what they told us. You're talking about trying to bring in witnesses from foreign countries to prove cases. You can do something wrong that isn't illegal. You can do something wrong that is not easily indictable or easily convictable. And although Durham's report and today's hearing was only focused on Trump's 2016 campaign investigation, Chairman Jim Jordan says that these consequences could reach even further than just political candidates. Parents at school board meetings are terrorists. Pro-life Catholics are extremists. Even journalists aren't safe. Although we know the DOJ repeatedly has denied this, saying that their work focuses solely on violence and threats of violence. As for what Congress is planning to do with this Durham report, they're planning to update the FISA regulations, which ultimately deals with how foreign intelligence is gathered. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Melina Weiskup, NTD News. The names of two Fulton County election workers are cleared. The Georgia State Election Board has dismissed its years-long investigation into alleged misconduct during the 2020 election. NTD's legal correspondent Arlene Richards has the details. An update since that hearing. Since November 2020, the Georgia Secretary of State's office had been investigating a complaint against two Fulton County election workers. The workers, Ruby Freeman and her daughter, Shea Moss, were accused of committing fraud while tabulating ballots. Videos that circulated on social media appear to show Freeman and Moss pulling ballots from suitcases hidden underneath tables and scanning the same batch of ballots multiple times. But on Tuesday, the Georgia State Elections Board voted to dismiss the investigation, saying there was no evidence of conspiracy. In December 2020, former President Trump's legal team testified before the Georgia Senate. During testimony, a video was played. It appeared to show poll workers pulling boxes of ballots out from under a tablecloth. Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, a Republican, said in a statement that three law enforcement agencies reviewed the entire unedited video footage of the events in question surrounding the two election workers at State Farm Arena. The investigative report, dated March 7, 2023, concluded that all allegations made against Freeman and Moss were unsubstantiated and found to have no merit. Raffensperger said false claims and knowingly false allegations made against these election workers have done tremendous harm. In 2022, Freeman said in testimony to the January 6th committee that her reputation was ruined. All because a group of people starting with number 45 and his ally, Rudy Giuliani, decided to scapegoat me and my daughter, Shay 
to push their own lies about how the presidential election was stolen. Freeman and Moss sued Trump's attorney Rudy Giuliani in December 2021 over alleged false claims about the video. Also in December 2021, they sued conservative media, the Gateway Pundit, for what they said were repeated publications of false claims portraying the two women as conspiring to steal a presidential election. Arlene Richards, NTD News. The House investigation of Hunter Biden will continue after he pleaded guilty to federal charges earlier this week. Here's House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer speaking to NTD. The FBI 1023 that alleges Joe Biden took a bribe, I would love to show the American people that, but they wouldn't give it to me. The FBI wouldn't give it to me because they said there's an ongoing investigation. I don't know who's investigating what. I know Hunter Biden was investigated for six years for not paying taxes and got a slap on the wrist yesterday while they let a lot of statutes of limitations expire. In spite of what Comer called Hunter Biden's sweetheart plea deal, the chairman committee said it would have no impact on the House investigation into the Biden family's business dealings and bribery allegations. Comer said, quote, we will not rest until the full extent of President Biden's involvement in the family schemes are revealed. He told NTD today that his committee will be bringing in people familiar with the matter to testify and subpoenaing more bank records from other countries. Articles of impeachment against President Biden and FBI Director Ray from two different representatives. The House might have to vote on both resolutions within the next two days. Here are the details and reactions to it. Impeaching Joseph R. Biden Jr., President of the United States, for high crimes and misdemeanors. Congresswoman Lauren Boebert of Colorado on Tuesday introduced articles of impeachment against President Biden. The resolution alleges abuse of power, stating that President Biden has intentionally facilitated a complete and total invasion at the southern border. It specifies that Biden ended migrant protection protocols, closed detention facilities, and more. The White House reportedly responded, saying that extreme House Republicans are staging baseless political stunts that do nothing to help real people and only serve to get themselves attention. Boebert is forcing the House to vote by using a privileged motion. This means the House has to vote on it within two days. However, Democrats already said they'd try to pass a motion which would block Boebert's effort. Meanwhile, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene on Wednesday also said she'll use a privileged motion. That's to impeach FBI Director Christopher Wray. She says Ray disrespected our oversight committee and our chairman Comer by forcing us to see redacted versions of unclassified 1023 forms that gave proof of then-VP Joe Biden taking a $5 million bribe. Also on Wednesday, House Republicans moved ahead with their plan to censure California Democrat Adam Schiff. Democrats tried to pass a motion to block the vote. On Wednesday, their motion failed 208 to 218. Congresswoman Anna Paulina Luna of Florida introduced the resolution to censure. As chair of the House Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff launched an all-out political campaign built on baseless distortions against a sitting U.S. president at the expense of every single citizen in this country and the honor of the House of Representatives. Republicans are accusing Schiff of pushing the Trump-Russia collusion narrative in 2016, knowing it wasn't true. The House postponed the vote to censure, but is expected to vote on it soon. The latest protester is sentenced over the January 6th Capitol breach. A man from California got over 12 years in jail for using a stun gun on a police officer during the breach. 40-year-old Daniel D.J. Rodriguez pleaded guilty on multiple charges. Those include conspiracy, obstructing an official proceeding, obstructing justice, and assaulting a law enforcement officer with a deadly or dangerous weapon. The last one was for using a stun gun on a D.C. police officer Michael Fanon's neck in the Capitol's Lower West Tunnel. U.S. District Judge Amy Berman Jackson sentenced Rodriguez to 12 and a half years in prison, plus nearly $100,000 in damages to D.C. police. The judge described Rodriguez as among the most serious offenders of January 6th. Rodriguez acknowledged his actions but stopped short of an apology. Coming up, President Biden calls Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping a dictator. How that plays into U.S.-China relations amid the latest round of high-level talks. And young Americans' scores in math and reading are even lower this past school year. Our guest coming up says students have lost a sense of purpose 
ultimately because of Marxist ideologies. More on that when we return. It's just clear as day. The media, whether it's broadcast, cable, or print media, has become extremely biased. And I started looking online for alternative ways to, to get information. And I saw an ad for a free trial. And I looked at it and I said, Epoch Times? I mean, come on, this is end of days type of stuff? I mean, what are they gonna be talking about here? And I said, well, it's a free trial, let me dig in. Is it giving me both sides? Is it giving me an objective point of view here? I have looked for opportunities to see where they might be biased, and I don't find it. It has given me a level of trust in media that I didn't think I'd ever get back. I love the Epoch Times because it has renewed uh, my faith in the idea that a reliable, responsible, non-biased source of information is available. And I can say that I love it because of that. William Bouguereau's staggering work, both in quantity and quality, numbered over 800 exquisite paintings during his lifetime. Bouguereau was an, the most famous artist in all of France, possibly all of Europe. These are emotionally powerful works, amongst the most powerful in art history. In this episode, we'll investigate the talent of a genius and a true master in his field who was first highly praised and recognized, but later destroyed. What was it about him or his art that made an entire society turn against him and banish both his name and his works? 2023, the 10th NTD International Classical Chinese Dance Competition aims to promote the traditional art of classical Chinese dance. From September 4th to 7th, top dancers from around the world will compete in skill and showcase talent at the Sugarloaf Performing Arts Center in New York. The gold award is $10,000. Apply now at dance.ntdtv.com. Anyone who's ever sold a home can tell you it is really hard. That's why who you work with matters. Together with Homelight, we've helped thousands of people sell faster and for the best price. You're not gonna get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff. Mama! Like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. Welcome back. President Biden calling China Xi Jinping a dictator. That comes barely a day after the U.S. and China held high-level talks. Entity's Iris Chow has more from the White House. And President Biden has called Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping a dictator, adding that he got very upset and embarrassed because a Chinese spy balloon was shot down in the U.S. earlier this year. And Biden made those comments during a fundraising event on Tuesday night, while adding that she got upset because he didn't know that his own government spy balloon ended up here. <laughs> Meanwhile, China hit back on Wednesday, calling Biden's comments open political provocations. And the latest crossfire here comes right after Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with Xi Jinping in Beijing in an attempt to ease tensions. Establishing open communications channels, directly raising issues of concern. But actually, it's not the first time that President Biden has some harsh comments on Xi Jinping. While campaigning for the White House in 2020, Biden calls Xi a thug. And in 2021, Biden said that Xi doesn't have a Democratic with a small d bone in his body. And while some say that Biden's latest comments here added uncertainty to his own administration's efforts to try to ease tensions, Mao Zhu, a former China advisor to the State Department, said that Biden's calling Xi a dictator actually helped Secretary Blinken's entreaties to Beijing by adding some teeth and strength to America's positions. 
And all this comes as President Biden is set to meet with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the White House on Thursday. The two leaders are expected to announce agreements on technology and defense cooperation. And a U.S. official told Reuters that Washington wants India to be a strategic counterweight to Beijing. Reporting from the White House, Aris Howe, NTD News. And to help us unpack Biden's recent comments on Xi is Grant Newsham, retired Marine colonel and senior fellow with the Center for Security Policy. Grant Newsham, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Well, thank you. Glad to be here. So President Biden kind of used an interesting term. He called Xi Jinping a dictator during a speech in California. Why do you think that is? Well, it's one, it's true, but that's beside the point. It's, uh, I think it reflects, unfortunately, really a lack of discipline uh, on the part of the president that we, we've seen before. Uh, that this is not something that you say uh, if you're the president. Uh, it does reflect some muddled thinking. Uh, you know, just we've seen it recently. You know, he's gone around saying that the uh, dictator. Uh, Xi Jinping didn't know about the spy balloon, for instance. And everyone on earth knows that he did. So he's trying to do a favor for the Chinese. It's probably not going to work. But he thinks that, look, if we cover this up, if we don't make a big deal of it, uh, he even referred to it as a silly, a silly balloon, you know, shouldn't get in the way of our relationship. And then in front of a different audience, he calls, calls Xi Jinping a dictator. And what does he think that is going to do uh, to the whatever relationship you've got? It's just guaranteed to infuriate the Chinese. And as I said, it reflects a muddled thinking, lack of discipline. And you have to ask, what do the Chinese think? You know, you you have this administration where they they say one thing, and you know they you know, kind of give us what we want. They uh, send Blink Secretary Blinken to China. We humiliate him and read the riot act to him again, saying that if there's any problems in this relationship, it's your Americans' fault. And he takes it, and then the administration calls Xi Jinping a dictator. Uh, and you wonder what they think. You know, is, does this reflect some fundamental confusion in administration policy, and administration willingness to deal uh, with threats? Uh, and, and what do our friends think of this? Uh, it suggests once again a an administration and unfortunately a president that um, really hasn't got his thoughts thoughts in order. And this really isn't uh, all that surprising. You know, we've seen similar language uh, from the president when he's talked about Saudi Arabia, you know, calling uh, them a pariah, saying it's a it's a government with with no redeeming social value. Uh, you look at the things that he said about President Obama when Obama was running for as a candidate. My goodness, you look at the good words that he put in for Senator Robert Byrd some years ago, uh, a, an officer in the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, Secretary Gates, uh, Robert Gates, Secretary of Defense, a while back, he may have gotten it right when he said, Joseph Biden has been, on the, been wrong about every major foreign policy issue in his lifetime. And as I say, to me, it's the troubling part is not calling Xi Jinping a dictator. Uh, it's simply that it uh, does indicate a lack of discipline, a lack of clear thinking. And this was supposed to be the uh, the new guys. And this administration came in and said the adults are back in charge. But my goodness, this is some pretty basic things that you don't do if you are a president, if you're conducting diplomacy. Uh, so I was uh, disappointed to hear it. I wasn't entirely uh, surprised, unfortunately. And now you have China's foreign minister responding, saying that these remarks seriously violated China's political dignity and amounted to public political provocation. How might, how might we expect China to react action-wise? Sanctions uh, on China that otherwise would be applied, maybe actually relaxing some of the existing sanctions, uh, maybe not making an issue of Chinese human rights, uh, not asking where the, uh, the COVID virus actually came from not insisting on a, an investigation into that. So they may get some concessions uh, if they scream loud enough as the Americans are embarrassed and you know, w seem uh, willing to do almost anything uh, to, they say, stabilize the relationship. But um, the US government seems to think that only the Americans can stabilize the relationship. Chinese behavior will continue as it always has, I think. Grant Newsham, thank you so much for your time.
Pleasure. Glad to be here. Turning now to education, the average test scores for 13-year-olds are still on the decline. According to newly released data from the nation's report card, scores in both math and reading got significantly worse last year. In fact, the decline in math scores last year was the biggest in the past 50 years. The new report is from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, and education leaders say the pandemic is a big reason why. Researchers assessed students from October to December in 2022. They then compared that assessment to the 2019-2020 school year. They found last year's test scores were down four points in reading and nine points in math. The report also showed a bigger gap between white and black students' test scores. There was a 13-point score decrease among black students compared to a 6-point decrease among white students. These new test scores from students across the country aren't looking good. But with pandemic lockdowns behind us, what's going on? We spoke with Catalina Stube, the director of Hispanic Outreach with Moms for Liberty, to learn more. Catalina Stube, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Tiffany. So the nation's report card just came out and it notes that this new federal data notes that 13-year-olds American test scores in math and reading are at a very low point, even lower than last year, with math scores actually falling to the lowest in 50 years. So how much did the pandemic and remote learning play into all of this? Well, this is a great question because I don't think it's a pandemic. And this is always the excuse from the government and from the other people. But the real um, reason is that it had they had been indoctrinated. And when you push uh, Marxism ideologies through children for decades ago, this is the result. This is the true result because now we have children confused on gender, on, on anything in, in life, actually. And, and it's this lack of purpose, on real purpose they have in life, that they lost all the motivation in school. Now we have a, um, children in depression. We have children, uh, more children attempting to get suicide. A lot of uh, young people actually suffer from anxiety. This is the result, the real result of this indoctrination push it to our children. And Catalina, you're the director of the Hispanic Outreach Moms for Liberty. And what about the immigrant parents who came to this country to give their children a better future? What's happening to them? Well, this is my case. I came here to pursue this American dream and to do better for my children. Unfortunately, I found out that my four children have been victim of gender ideologies, of uh, indoctrination. So I personally see all the pro- programs uh, created by the Department of Education how have been only a problem for my children because we can see with the creation of all these programs, we don't have to see any improvement on, on the youth. And and so what, what I'm suggesting is stop thinking that the American dream right now is the solution of all your problem, because it's not. Right now I am doing homeschooling and uh, I have to work boldly on my children and teach them more spiritual guidance because uh, to, to, you know, put in the balance all this bad behaviors that they are learning from schools. Homeschooling have all the solutions, let's say, uh, for parents who are more busy and for children that are a little more independent or dependent. It depends because you can create a curriculum exactly, exactly what you want for your children. It's a great solution. Sounds like there's always a path forward and always some hope. And Catalina Stube, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Tiffany. Coming up, nearly one third of the country's homeless population is in California. Presidential candidate Ron DeSantis visits and criticizes San Francisco, a city now often known for its homeless crisis. And your interest rates may not be coming down anytime soon. Fed Chair Jerome Powell told lawmakers rates may continue rising throughout the year. Stay tuned for more after the break. Hi, I'm Susan Lucci. You may know me from my many years on television. I never thought about heart disease until I had my own heart event. 
felt this slight pressure in my chest, just slight. I thought, oh, it's nothing, it'll go away. I didn't get it. I did not get it. But a few days later, while shopping at a boutique, that pressure returned much stronger. It felt like an elephant pressing on my chest. I had a 90% blockage in my main artery and a 75% blockage in the adjacent artery. I was rushed into surgery where I received two stents in my arteries. Stents developed through research funded by the American Heart Association. Those stents saved my life. That's why I'm in front of you today, asking you to join me in supporting the American Heart Association by becoming a monthly donor. Call now or go to helpheart.org. For only $19 a month, just 63 cents a day, you can help fund the next medical breakthrough. Get the next person trained in CPR, the next hospital certified in high quality cardiovascular care. I'm so grateful to the American Heart Association. Their research helped save my life. I can enjoy life with my children, my grandchildren, and my friends. Heart disease is America's number one killer, and your support now can help save your life or the life of someone you love. Give $19 a month with your credit card and we'll send you this special t-shirt that you can wear to show that you are helping save lives. Please, listen to your heart. The only reason I'm here today is because I did. So please call the number on your screen or go to helpheart.org now. Join me as a monthly donor today and help save even more lives. Thank you. Okay, Dad. One, two, Three. You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. California is home to nearly one-third of the nation's homeless population. A study indicates that cost of housing is a key factor. Meanwhile, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis visited San Francisco and criticized its leadership. NTD's David Lamb reports. Recently, the University of California, San Francisco, released its findings on homelessness, indicating that 171,000 people experience homelessness on a daily basis in California. UCSF study stated, quote, while 12% of the overall United States population lives in California, 30% of the nation's homeless population and half the nation's unsheltered population, those living outside in vehicles or in places not meant for a human habitation, reside here. For most of the participants, cost of housing was unsustainable, where their median monthly household income was $960 six months prior to being homeless. Two-thirds reported current mental health symptoms and more than a third experienced physical or sexual violence during this episode of homelessness. The study also provided policy recommendations around improving affordable housing, prevention and behavioral health services, as well as employment support. Meanwhile, on Tuesday, 2024, Republican presidential candidate Ron DeSantis made a stop in the city of San Francisco for his campaign tour. He took a moment to criticize the city's, quote, leftist policies. We're here in the once great city of San Francisco. We came in here and we saw people defecating on the street. We saw people using heroin. We saw people smoking crack cocaine. And you look around, uh, the city is not vibrant anymore. 
And just a day later, on Wednesday, SF Mayor London Breed announced SFPD's efforts in disrupting open-air drug markets. She said on Twitter, This year alone, SFPD has made 390 arrests for drug sales in the Tenderloin and Soma and seized 61 kilos of fentanyl, enough for 30 million lethal doses of the deadly drug. Now in May... SF Mayor London Breed proposed a $14.6 billion annual budget for the next two years to focus on behavioral health, homelessness, and public safety. This is expected to be voted on by August 1st. In Santa Clara, California, David Lamb, NTD News. Interest rates are likely to continue getting higher and higher, according to Fed Chair Jerome Powell. He told lawmakers that they're still very far away from their 2% inflation goal and that he's going to continue raising rates until he hits that goal. The rate hikes are likely to continue. Fed Chair Jerome Powell told lawmakers that the Fed is still very far away from its 2% inflation rate target. The rate is currently 4.7%. He says a majority of policymakers see two more quarter point rate increases as likely by the end of 2023. Inflation pr pressures continue to run high and the process of getting inflation back down to 2 percent has a long way to go. When inflation is high, the Fed tries to lower it by raising interest rates. Specifically, it makes it more expensive for banks to borrow from each other. As a result, the banks then raise credit card rates, auto loan rates, mortgage rates, and business loan rates. This slows down the economy and therefore lowers inflation. During the latest Fed meeting, Powell did not raise rates. This is because the Fed plans for the hikes to be less aggressive. The level to which we raise rates is actually a separate question of the speed with which we move. Earlier in the process, speed was very important. It's not very important now. The sense of the of the summary of economic projections and the decision really is just that, given how far we've come, it may make sense to move rates higher, but to do so at a more moderate pace. Other key takeaways from the hearing, Powell believes the U.S. dollar will remain the world's reserve currency for a long time to come. And he addressed privacy concerns regarding the central bank digital currency the Fed is currently working on. He said that he doesn't want private individuals to hold accounts at the Fed. If they did, the Fed would be able to track all of their transactions. Faye Quarter, NTD News. The Federal Trade Commission is suing Amazon, accusing the company of tricking its customers. Today, the FTC filed a federal lawsuit alleging Amazon deceived millions of consumers into signing up for its Prime subscription service. Prosecutors say Amazon also used deceptive interface designs known as dark patterns to thwart users who were actually trying to cancel their memberships. No word from Amazon about the lawsuit. And are used car prices coming down? Is supply meeting demand? Is there still a chip shortage in the industry? NTD Business's Don Ma speaks to a car industry expert. And here to talk to me about the used car industry is Lauren Fix, automotive expert for Car Coach Reports. Now, there's reports that are saying car prices are going up, but on the other hand, there's also reports saying car prices, used car prices, that is, are going down. Now, what are you seeing? Are they going up or are they going down? Well, here's the reality of it. The wholesale prices, when the dealers buy amongst themselves, whether they go to auction or they use something like ACV auctions, that price has dipped a little bit but the retail price has not altered. And in some cases, if it's a high demand vehicle, like a three row SUV or a luxury SUV, those prices have actually gone up. So it depends what you're looking at. Pickup trucks, SUVs, they're very popular right now. If you're looking for a car, you might be able to find some deals. Again, a lot of it's timing, how long the vehicle has been sitting on the lot. But if you look at the actual numbers that are coming off the auction blocks, you're seeing that the prices have dipped a bit, which means the profit margin for each of the dealer groups, whether it be a dealer or a used car lot, has increased. This dip, is it significant because used car prices is part of the CPI, Consumer Price Index, uh, for inflation, right? Is it going to help bring down inflation? No, it's not at all. Actually, you may see the price dip just a teeny bit, but it's going to go back up because it has to do with supply and demand. When the demand is high, which it was, People were couldn't get new cars, so they switched to used cars. So hence, you saw the prices go through the roof. And dealers were taking advantage of that. Manufacturers were taking advantage of that. 
now we have a limited still supply of product coming in. Remember, a lot of these parts come out of China. Uh, you've got parts for catalytic converters that come out of Russia, wiring harnesses out of the Ukraine and other areas. We're still having no resolution. There. We still have a chip shortage, believe it or not, three years in. This should have been resolved. But the chip manufacturers are trying to build in the U.S., and it takes about five years from the time they decide to build a plant in the U.S. to the time they actually produce their first, what we call in our industry, a legacy chip. So when you're thinking about a chip, you might be thinking of something small like a SD card or of the chips that are in your phone. They're much larger when it comes to a car. They're an older design, and it's very difficult for a brand to just do a complete switch. So until we can catch up on the supply chain, everything from logos of names, like Ford couldn't get logos for the front of their trucks. They're not gonna sell trucks without the Ford logo on it. So you're starting to see that kind of thing is still in play, which means limited supply. So they're building high luxury brand cars. So what does that mean for you as a consumer? If they're building more luxury, fully loaded cars, and you're looking to buy a car that doesn't have a lot of options, maybe a work truck or just for budget reasons, you're going to find that that's going to be difficult for you to find cars. So used cars have still hold their value and the used car dealers are well aware of that. And you're still seeing lots filled with mostly used cars. Are car, used car prices ever going to go back to, to the prices that we're, we were used to before the rise? Well, that is a very good question because I think that's what people are waiting for. Um, I think until this recession, which we are in a recession, uh, I have an economics degree, I will tell you, 101, first day you learn what a recession is, and this is what we are in right now. And until that changes, I don't believe we're going to see softer prices for used cars uh, with more mandates coming from the federal government saying you have to buy an electric car or it's going to have more computer chips in it. People are very wary about this big data. So there, a lot of people are looking at used cars, and that used car value is still going to be in play I'm thinking for at least another two to three years. All right, Lauren Fix, expert for Car Coach Reports. Pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. Coming up in baseball, Shohei Otane is the most coveted player in the game, yet that doesn't mean the Angels are going to keep him. And sports shoes made with kangaroo leather. As animal welfare advocates propose to ban the material, scientists say that's not in the animal's best interests. NDD Stephanie Cox explores the issue after the break. What if you could whiten your teeth by simply brushing your teeth? Now you can with Smile Actives, the teeth whitening breakthrough that safely gets your teeth white and keeps them white every day just by brushing your teeth. I never thought that whitening my teeth could be so easy. I just put the gel on the brush, the toothpaste on it, brush, and I can see my white teeth. Simply add Smile Actives to any toothpaste and our patented PolyClean technology activates into a powerful microfoam that penetrates into the enamel surface to safely lift and remove stains. You need a simple way to whiten your teeth without strips, without trays, without going to the dentist. And it was about time that a product was developed that you would be able to do that with just brushing. And now Smile Actives is even better with new Pro Whitening Gel with 33% greater whitening power, clinically shown to whiten teeth faster, up to eight shades. 100% of users saw whiter teeth on food stains, coffee and wine stains, even on veneers, crowns, and dentures. I eat the blueberries, I drink the coffee, and I know that Smile Actives will keep my teeth white every day. If you could use something so easy like Smile Actives to take yellow teeth to white teeth, why wouldn't you? Why spend hundreds of dollars for whitening treatments at the dentist when now you can whiten your teeth with new Smile Actives Pro Whitening Gel every time you brush your teeth? Call or go to smileactives.com and for a limited time, get new Pro Whitening Gel for just $24.95. Order in the next five minutes and buy one, get one absolutely free for just $24.95. That's two for one and save 58%. We'll even include free shipping. Get your teeth whiter guaranteed or return it within 60 days for your money back. I smile every day now. <laughs> The difference is literally night and day. So now I'm always smiling, always choosing, because now my teeth are much whiter. This offer is not available in stores, so call or click now before the special buy one, get one free offer goes away.
Welcome back. And now for your sports news, we have NTD's Dave Martin joining us to discuss some news from Major League Baseball. Dave, the Los Angeles Angels have said they're unlikely to deal Shohei Otane if they remain in playoff contention. What's the significance of this? Well, it's pretty big. I mean, normally you would not expect a team that's about that could reach the postseason to be thinking of trading trading away their best player. But Shohei Otani is the most coveted player in the game. And you know, this he is only signed through the end of this season. This offseason, he's a free agent, and they have yet to sign him to an extension. Of course, they could try to sign him to extension, but it doesn't seem like there's mutual interest in that. Uh, now, if they do actually trade him, though, I mean, his value is immense. Even if the receiving team only gets him for two months, then you've got two months to exclusively negotiate with him. So they would probably be giving up a lot to the Angels uh, in return. And on that note, what makes him so valuable? Well, I mean, no one since Babe Ruth 100 years ago has been this good of a hitter and a pitcher. Now, Ruth, they had to turn him into a hitter pretty quickly because you didn't have the designated hitter rule back then. So Ruth had to play the field. Otani, though, can be a DH. And I mean, as a hitter, he's leading the league in home runs and RBIs. While as a pitcher, I mean, last year he was fourth uh, in the Cy Young voting. Meanwhile, he has the lowest opponent's batting average against him as a pitcher. Uh, if he got traded to, to another team, they would have just one roster spot to have a great pitcher and a great hitter. And I'll tell you, when he reaches free agency, we were gawking at $300 million contracts last offseason. I think he could even get $500 million. Lots of money on the line. And switching now to golf, Dave, what's the latest on the PGA merger? Well, the, the three that are in the alliance there have really have been invited to uh, the Senate uh, and not in a good way. Uh, you know, this is the uh, subcommittee for investigations. And the three I'm talking about, of course, are the CEO of PGA, which is Jay Monahan, as well as the LIV CEO, uh, which is Greg Norman, as well as the governor of Saudi Arabia's public investment fund. Now, all, the, all of these politicians are pretty much saying the same thing. They do not like seeing their beloved American institution, the PGA, become a vessel for Saudi Arabia's public uh, or Saudi Arabia's government to do their sports washing. Now, how much how much they can do legally, I don't know, but they're certainly applying uh, a lot of pressure with this right now. And Dave, now that the basketball and hockey seasons have ended, what else do you see becoming a major story this summer in sports? Well, we're all waiting for the next uh, conference realignment in college sports. You know, last summer, USC and UCLA both announced they're leaving the Pac-12 for the Big Ten, which greatly weakened the Pac-12. And they're coming up for um, negotiating their TV rights for, for sports right now. And this all depends on how much you can pay your conference members. Uh, so we don't know really what's going on behind the scenes, but it's very likely that right now these Pac-12 schools are probably in discussions with other conferences for what-if scenarios. Because if they don't get enough from the Pac-12, and the commissioner knows this, that's why this TV deal is taking so long, then these other schools will probably bolt, and then you'll see the Pac-12 may not be the power conference uh, that it once was. Dave, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tiff. Some soccer cleats are made with kangaroo leather. It's lighter and more durable than other leather, but its use is declining over concern for the Australian marsupial's welfare. Nike announced earlier this year that it would stop using the material in its shoes in the face of a now shelved bill to ban it in Oregon, where Nike is based, and similar efforts across the nation. But some Australian scientists say such a move ultimately harms the animal. NTD's Stephania Cox is there now examining the issue. Kangaroos, an Australian icon that both animal rights activists and conservationists say is in urgent need of help, but for different reasons. President of Animal Wellness Action Wayne Pacelli says U.S. reform efforts are designed to disassociate the United States from the world's largest commercial slaughter of native wildlife. What we're trying to do is decommercialize the hunt and the kill and allow kangaroos who have been on the Australian landscape for 15 million years and are beautifully evolved to live in arid environments to avoid the pain and the suffering that comes with mass shooting for non-essential purposes. 
But to ecologist Catherine Mosby, controlled shooting may well be the most humane solution for a kangaroo population facing the inevitable drought and then starvation that follows periods of heavy rainfall in this country. She lives and works in regional Australia, surrounded by kangaroos every day. I've seen kangaroos get their eyes pecked out by birds. I've seen joeys suckling at dead mothers for you know hours after the mothers died. Um, it, like I said before, I've seen kangaroos eating the guts out of other kangaroos. And this is what happens during droughts in Australia. Our estimates are that nearly 6 million animals died in the last drought. Honorary professor at the Australian National University, George Wilson, says for that to happen to the national symbol is disgraceful. It's really dishonouring kangaroos to let that happen. Mosby says that due to this boom before the bust, when fewer kangaroos are killed under the oversight of a regulated industry, more will be killed through unregulated means. And it will have worse outcomes for the kangaroos from, a, from an animal welfare point of view, because they'll be killed by you know, backyard farmers and they'll starve to death during droughts and um, it, it, they'll have joeys that, that will be left in pouches and not killed humanely. So this ban on kangaroo products is not going to improve the animal welfare of kangaroos. It's going to make it worse. The Australian RSPCA is an animal welfare organization. It says it's concerned with the large numbers of kangaroos shot inhumanely, particularly under the non-commercial system, which is where the government gives permits to people to shoot the kangaroos on their property. Most of the animals are on pastoral property. They're not in some giant national park. But non-commercial shooters are not trained or accountable in the same way that shooters with commercial permits are. Wilson says if graziers or farmers had more ownership over the kangaroos, they would have an incentive to look after the next generation. Wilson, Mosby and other scientists are calling for a national kangaroo strategy. We should be increasing the value of kangaroo so that it's able to compete with sheep and cattle pr products and therefore create margins that enable the graziers and the pastoralists to um, cease to regard them as pests. A solution they say that would better manage the extreme boom and bust population cycles and improve kangaroo conservation and welfare. And while this niche industry may be impacted by the threat of bans and declining demand, Paselli says the commercial trade of kangaroos is at odds with the norms of modern wildlife management. Reporting in Newcastle, Australia, Stephanie Cox, NTD News. And finally, from the paintings hidden under Renaissance masterpieces to the writings of many ancient documents, the colors behind these works have a surprising source. NTD's Jane Wirrell met with a pigment maker who's keeping the craft alive. This I found in a, in a Victorian dump. Uh, we'll create different um, kind of shades of blue because there are impurities in the metal. London-based pigment maker Lucy Mays creates pigments from often overlooked materials. It's so ubiquitous to find, you know, a broken brick or a piece of, you know, green or grey slate. You can crush and wash and grind and sieve um, the resulting particles to use as paint. And I think there's something quite um, sort of revolutionary about it and exciting about it that you can literally paint with a red brick. Pigment making has a rich history. These here are both burnt ochres, which relate very clearly to Renaissance underpaintings where they would have used burnt umber and burnt sienna to kind of render the composition before going in with um, other colours. Those early layers you call the ground layers, um, so when you're painting the ground, I mean obviously it makes sense, um, which is ironically painted with the ground, which is an earth colour, <laughs> um, it's like the basis for the painting. In Britain, ink made from oak ghouls has been used since Roman times. Oak gall ink is when an oak gall wasp lays its egg in the bud of a growing um, acorn and instead of an acorn growing you get a gall and these come in lots of different sizes and shapes depending on the species of wasp um, and these are very rich in tannins that you can create a brown ink or a very very deep black ink from. Van Gogh, Rembrandt, 
Leonardo da Vinci will use the sink as well. Pigment making was recently classified as an endangered craft. Lucy is one of only about 10 professionals in the UK keeping it alive. She says it's brought about a greater appreciation of her surroundings. By making these pigments, um, I can personally reflect on my own relationship to my surroundings, be it within an urban setting or within a more natural setting. And by doing that, I, I think that I'm reconnecting with these raw materials from nature that um, are often perhaps overlooked. Jane Worrell, NTD News, London. If you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. That's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.